And our latest newsletter is now ready, and I'll give you the address uh, at the end of the programme. Uh, for the first time for several months, we have some planets on view. Jupiter now comes into view in the very late evening, and of course there is Venus, shining brilliantly in the western sky after sunset, looking almost like a small lamp. And I've had quite a number of letters asking me what it is. Well, of course, Venus is much the brightest of all the planets. So far as the stars are concerned, uh, we have mainly lost Orion now with its brilliant retinue, but to make up for that, the brilliant summer constellations are coming nicely in sight. And we have what I christened the Summer Triangle, a name that now seems to have become more or less official. And it's made up of three bright stars in different constellations. There is Vega in Lyra, the Lyra, and Vega is a brilliant blue star almost overhead during summer evenings. There is Deneb in Cygnus the Swan, and there is Altair in Aquila, the Eagle. And uh, you can recognize Altair very easily because it has a fainter star to either side of it. So, actually, it has Antares in the Scorpion, which is very much lower down, but you can't mistake those two, because not only is Antares much lower, but also it's very red, one of the reddest of all the naked eye stars, whereas Altair is pure white. Cygnus is a very interesting constellation. It's a rich area, the Milky Way flows through it, and if you've got binoculars, well, have a sweep through Cygnus, and you'll find endless good star fields. But it's often called the Northern Cross, for fairly obvious reasons, I think. And there is one star in the cross, Albario, which is rather fainter than the rest and further away from the center. So it does tend to spoil the symmetry a bit. But to make up for that, Albario is a lovely double star. And if you have any small telescope or even good binoculars, have a look at it and you will see that the primary star, the bright one, is golden yellow and the companion is blue. Well, there are plenty of colored double stars in the sky, but I always think myself that Albario is the most beautiful of the lot. But this evening, I want to talk to you something quite near Albario in the sky, but which you quite definitely will not see. It's known as 1937 plus 21. That's its catalogue number. It was discovered quite recently. It's a radio source, and it is, in fact, a pulsar. And it's a very strange pulsar indeed, because it's vibrating more rapidly than any pulsar previously discovered. I think that most people know that bodies in the sky send out radiations at all wavelengths, not only visible light. Visible light is a very small part of the total range of wavelengths, which we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And bodies in the sky send out very short waves of gamma rays and ultraviolet. Then we have visible light, microwaves, infrared, and then we have radio waves. And there are plenty of radio sources in the sky. Radio stars is a bad term, that was given up a long time ago. But radio sources are common, and they are of various kinds. And they're picked up with radio telescopes, which are really in the nature of huge aerials. But in 1967, astronomers at Cambridge were using a very special kind of radio telescope, and that is it. It looks rather more like a hop field than anything else, nothing like the Jodrell Bank type dish. And they made a remarkable discovery. They picked up a strange radio source which appeared to be ticking. And that is the no noise made by one of the early pulsars to be discovered. Uh, of course, do let me make it quite clear that you're not actually hearing sounds from space. Uh, sound waves are, can't be carried in a vacuum. That noise is created inside the equipment, but you can see the very rhythmical ticking there. And the name pulsar seemed very appropriate, and it was quite unexpected. And there was a very brief period, not more than a few hours, when it was seriously thought that it might be some kind of artificial signal coming from space. But that was soon disproved, and other pulsars started coming uh, into a sight. One of these is in the Crab Nebula. We know what the Crab Nebula is. It's the remnant of a star which exploded as a supernova way back in the year 1054, and it was recorded then by Chinese and Japanese astronomers. Of course, the actual outburst happened a long time before that because the Crab Nebula is something like 6,000 light years away. And inside the Crab Nebula, there is a pulsar which has been optically identified. And there's only a, one other pulsar which has been identified with an optical object, and that's in the southern constellation of Vela, the sails. And that identification was made uh, over at the Australian Austra Observatory of Siding Spring. And there is the Vela Pulsar. Well, now, what in fact is a pulsar? Now we have a pretty good idea. I mentioned a little while ago the Crab Nebula, which was an exploding star. And we believe that, we believe that many pulsars, if not all, are the remnants of these supernova explosions. What happens is that a very massive star comes to the end of its active life, 
It's used up all its nuclear fuel, so to speak, and things get out of control. And the star blows a lot of its material away into space, so you have a patch of expanding gas, such as the Crab Nebula. And what's left collapses down into a very small, super-dense object made of neutrons. And neutrons are uh, fundamental particles with no electric charge. And they can be packed very close together, so neutron star material is incredibly dense. For example, if I could fill that glass with material from a neutron star, it would weigh thousands of millions of tons, and I certainly couldn't pick it up. Neutron stars are quite incredible things. We also know that they have very powerful magnetic fields. They're small, and they're spinning around very rapidly. Until recently, the quickest spinner of all was the pulsar in the middle of the Crab Nebula, and that spins 30 times every second. But now that record has been well and truly broken by this new pulsar, 1937 plus 21. And here, the rate is actually 642 vibrations every second. You can't, of course, hear them individually. They're too quick for that. But if you wonder what the note is, the answer is it's E flat. Well, radio astronomy has become all important. I suppose the very center of radio astronomy everywhere is Jodrell Bank. And, of course, at Jodrell Bank, great attention is being paid to pulsars. And that 250-foot dish is just as effective now as it was when it first came into action over a quarter of a century ago. And uh, who better to tell us about this and about this latest exciting pulsar than the director of Jodrell Bank, who is also, of course, the Astronomer Royal, Professor, Professor Graham Smith. Graham, welcome back to the sky tonight. Uh, this new pulsar may be more important than one thinks, I imagine. Well, yes, it's, uh, it's raised some really important problems. We, we were just beginning to understand what pulsars are and where they come from and what their life might be. And then this odd one turned up, which is really quite different from all the others. What makes it so out of the ordinary, apart from its quick spin? Well, you know that we've got about 320 of them now, and um, we found most of them in an ordinary search procedure, which we've uh, standardized on, and we scan the sky, and we add to the catalogue and so forth. But this one didn't come from that ordinary search. It came from a catalogue of other radio sources, which also came from Cambridge. It's known as a 4C source. And uh, in Holland, a big radio telescope was used to make a map of it. Mm -hmm. Now, that one source turned out to be two, which you can see on this picture as two separate objects. And on one of them, there was an extra little pip just on one side, an almost insignificant part of the object. But it turned out to have a very curious spectrum, and it was also very highly polarized. So it was known to be something very odd. In fact, lots of people knew it must be a pulsar. Trouble was, nobody could find the periodicity. The reason was it was far too short, of course. And it actually came to uh, Arecibo, the big radio telescope in Arecibo, to uh, discover the pulsations at one and a half milliseconds. So they found it was pulsating, and it was 20 times as fast as the Crab Pulsar, 20 times as fast, and it wasn't slowing down, at least not very much. So it couldn't possibly have been um, a white dwarf star or anything of that nature? Oh, no, no. It was certainly going to be somewhat like the ordinary pulsars, but if we look at the way we classify the pulsars, you'll see that it's quite different. Now, here's the usual classification. We plot them according to their period. There's a tenth of a second up to one second along the bottom, and their slowdown rate. They're all slowing down. They're all slowing down, that means yes. They're, they're, they're losing energy. They're losing energy because they're actually radiating it away. They've got a strong magnetic field. Now, if you look up at the top left there, you'll find the youngest, at least what we thought was the youngest, I think it must still be, the crab. And then you come down to Vela, and we rather think that those lines on the picture represent the ways in which pulsars evolve as they get older. Uh, the only ones which were a little discrepant are the two crosses, which you can see down there at fairly short periods. Those actually are binary pulsars. Nevertheless, we thought we could fit those in in some way. But when it came to this new one, you can see that that's way off to the left of the diagram, which means, first of all, very short period, but also astonishingly slow slowdown rate. I mean, how, how could possibly we could fit that in with those other ones? I, I, I can't imagine yet. So it's different in many ways from the ordinary pulsar. Well, it is, and I think the most interesting question is to think, how can it possibly spin so fast? How can it be made to spin so fast? I mean, there are various ways it might happen. If you take an ordinary star and condense it down, like the ballet dancer yes. holding her arms in, you know, it goes around faster. And it's just conceivable you can do it with a single star. 
But um, during this last three months, there have been three separate theories as to how it's done. And there's an interesting one which involves a binary system. A, a large star, uh, possibly a, a red giant, and the, a tiny little neutron star. And the neutron star has a strong gravitational field. It can pull material out of the, the big red giant. And as it reaches the, uh, the neutron star, it tends to circle it. Now, those two stars are going round one another, and consequently, you find that the matter is actually going round the, the pulsar, round the neutron star. And if we put the neutron star in the middle there, you can see that it can actually be speeded up as the matter falls in on it. We're showing you there the, um, the pulsar with the two radio beams being speeded up by matter which falls on it. What about those radio beams? Why exactly do they occur with all pulsars? Well, again, that's something to do with the magnetic field. We think that um, we've got the, the magnetic field is rather like the field of the Earth, only much stronger. It's got two poles, one out each way. And if from each pole, you get a radio beam. Now make it rotate, and you've got the beams, which two beams which stick out, and you see the two pulses. Some of them, you only see one because the, the beam isn't lined up in quite the right way. Well, that's one idea of speed speeding up the pulsar. What are the others? Well, another one is um, that you might have a binary system, two condensed stars going round one another, and they radiate away energy by gravitational waves and collapse together. And when they fuse, they'll be going round much faster. It's a double mass but uh, much faster neutron star. And the last one, as I uh, said before, is that it might be a, a single pulsar, and for some reason, connected with having a small magnetic field, it goes around faster when it collapses. It can't throw away angular momentum like the other pulsars did. Well, apart from all this, what do we really know about this thing? I mean, you say it's small to start with. Uh, well, we're, we're pretty sure of the size. It's about sort of 20 miles across or something. How can you be certain of that? Well, if it were, for example, a white dwarf size, that would be far too big. And going around at this speed, centrifugal force would make it burst. There's not a chance of having it very much larger than 20 miles. Well, look, this 1937 pulsar, that's going around so fast already that the surface is moving with a tenth of the speed of light. So if you make it much bigger, then it's just impossible by all reasonable theories. What, what about the distance? The distance, well, that's about um, 8,000 light years or so, well away from us, but in our galaxy. How can you tell that? Oh, there's a, there's a marvelous uh, way of telling distance. As the pulses come through space, so they're delayed by the ionized gas in space. And the amount of delay depends on the radio frequency you use. So you use two different radio frequencies, you get two different delays, and you can immediately measure the distance, really remarkably accurately and very simply. Well, of course, these pulsars are moving, are they not? And that brings us on to the question of the way in which they are scintillating or twinkling, whatever you call it. Yeah, that's right. The, the fact that they are moving fast is probably very significant, something to do with their origin. Uh, as you said, they're, they're probably originating in explosions of stars. Make that explosion slightly asymmetric, and you might find that the neutron star is being shot off. We find, at any rate, that most pulsars are moving quite fast. You can actually see them moving across the sky if you've got an accurate enough radio telescope. But you can also measure their movement through their scintillation. And I perhaps best explain this with the model that we've got here in the studio, which actually shows one of the studio lights and then a piece of glass, which is the kind of corrugated glass you get in bathroom windows, and then the pattern of light that you get on the wall behind the piece of glass. Now, if you move the light steadily across the floor, you see, of course, that the pattern moves. Now, this is a very good representation of what happens in radio astronomy. The, uh, the studio light is the pulsar, the glass is the uh, interstellar gas, and the pattern on the screen is a pattern of radio intensity on the ground. As it goes past, as the pulsar moves, so the signal fluctuates. The faster it fluctuates, the faster the pulsar must be moving. So we know that this pulsar is moving at about 70 kilometers a second. Is that more or less average for pulsars? Oh, some of them go up to a couple of hundred. It's quite a reasonable average velocity, yes. Mm. So in many ways, this new exceptional object does behave like an ordinary pulsar. The trouble is it's, it's so much faster. It's got a radio emission. It's got those two beams. It's polarized. It's uh, slowing down somewhat. And it's got the same sort of velocity. But uh, it just doesn't quite fit. It certainly seemed to be something on its own. And of course, I'm fascinated by this 
almost complete lack of slowing down. You have measured some amount of slowing down, haven't you? We have, yes. You see, the slowing down comes from the magnetic field. And uh, all we can say about the strength of the field is that it must be or about one ten thousandth of the field from the ordinary pulsars. Mind you, when you've got one ten thousandth of that field, you've still got a large one, which is about a hundred million times the terrestrial field. So it's not negligible. And uh, all, all we can say is that neutron stars must be a certain size, and consequently the field must be about 10,000 times down. On the other hand, uh, the slowdown that we do measure is a, just appreciable, and it corresponds to an age of about 100 million years. That sounds rather long to me. Well, I think it is. It's, uh, I don't believe the thing's as old as that. That's unreasonable. I think it's younger, and it's been spun up in some way. We seem to be collecting more and more pulsars of different kinds, but do you think they are all due to supernova remnants? Because after all, there are some supernovae that don't seem to leave pulsars. So uh, there's rather a pulsar glut. I think there's a pulsar glut. Uh, we'd really like to find a, a, a new way of, of making pulsars, if you like, but uh, we haven't come up with that yet. And all we can do is to try and find the total population of them and their lifetime and see whether supernovae go off sufficiently frequently to account for that. Meanwhile, of course, we've, we've got an extraordinary thing. We've got a clock in the sky of incredible accuracy. It's the most accurate clock that exists outside the solar system. We timed this object for about three weeks, soon after it was discovered, and uh, here you can see some of the results, just a, a scatter of, um, of small errors, uh, errors in our timing rather than the pulsar. Look at the scale. 20 microseconds, a microsecond is a millionth of a second. And we kept count of the rotation of this pulsar, which is once every one and a half milliseconds, all through those three weeks, and we didn't miss a beat. And we find that we can actually time it to within about 10 microseconds. Now, I don't know what we're going to do with this, but it is the most accurate clock that uh, we could ever hope to have. Yes, but you've timed it so far for only 20 days. Can you be sure that it's now behaving typically? Well, you can never be sure of anything in astronomy, but uh, I'd be prepared to take a small bet on this one, that this is, in fact, a pulsar with a weak magnetic field, and it's going to go steadily on in much the same way as it is now for quite a long time. And what will eventually happen to it? Ah, I think it just dies. I, I know of nothing else it can do. It, it'll eventually... Um, just run out of energy and it'll be spinning quite slowly it won't have enough energy to radiate radio it hasn't got enough energy to radiate light and it's going to be there as a dark object just winging its way through the sky quite fast but nobody will see it and there could be some of these things quite close to us then oh yes I believe there are a lot of them around which have gone through this phase uh, you can be sure that there isn't one in the solar system no, at the moment. We'd certainly it, detect that by the movements well, of the planets, yes. Absolutely. It's so heavy that it would perturb all the movements, and you'd see everything going haywire. So there's none of them anywhere near us. Well, you've discovered this amazing pulsar, um, more or less by accident, I think is fair I think to that's say. Fair to but say. are you now making um, a, a search for others? Of course. Uh, I, I showed you that um, uh, there was the Cambridge object and a Dutch map. That's happening again, and we've got a list of about 60 suspects that have got to be searched for. It's, it's no easy task, I may say, searching for these things. You've got to r record an awful lot of information and crunch it through a computer and so on. Well, we're doing that on these 60 sources, and it's being done at Arecibo. And furthermore, we're going to search the, a large chunk of the Milky Way for some more of them as well. Well, let's hope you have luck, and thank you again very much, Graham, for coming along and telling us about this most exciting discovery. Uh, I said I'd give you the address for the newsletter, and here it is, the usual one. Uh, newsletter number nine, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W128QT, and I'm afraid you must send the stamp to this envelope because that is the only way in which we can cope with sending them out. But I think you'll agree then that um, we are finding out new things, not every year, but almost every month. And this new pulsar is one of the most exciting discoveries of modern times. And of course, we'll give you extra news about it as soon as more discoveries come in. For the moment, from Graham Smith and myself, good night. That look at the quickest pulsar is shown again next Saturday afternoon at half past five on BBC Two. The 8th of May is the date for the next edition of The Sky at Night on BBC One Scotland. <laughs>